God has given over the course of history different people to the, His people for their benefit, for their growth, for their encouragement, for their edification through love. And we've been studying in the Sunday school classes uh, the book of Hebrews. It starts off in many times and in various ways. God has spoken in time past through His prophets. But in these latter days, He has spoken to us through His dear Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want to explain to you, first of all, what I see my goal as. But second of all, what I see my actual responsibility and my attitude during it being. So you can know why I do what I do. And this morning I want you to turn Ephesians chapter 4, if you're not already there, verses 11 through 13. It says, And he himself, this is referring to Christ, referring to God, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, most of us, when we're reading this passage, stop right there abruptly in the middle of a sentence. Very terrible to do that, because we need to see the goal. Because a lot of us in ministry get a real hard time following this. If that verse ended there, I will tell you right off, I, will, I would never have been in ministry. That would have been an impossible call. If I have no goal and I just sit here and aim at that and don't know when that ends or anything of this or don't know really what the focus is, it would have really harmed me. And so I'm very happy that verse 13 is here because it gives me a goal. And it's the goal I look at with everything that I do. Every Wednesday night that you guys come over and you know, have cookies and coffee over there and we sit and talk about one of the prophets. Or every morning I come up here to share with you what I've been learning this week through the Word of God or every Sunday school lesson that we've been going through, everything I have this goal in mind, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. That gives me a goal. That gives me something to shoot at. I want you guys to fellowship, and I know I'm, my heritage is from the Midwest, so I say you guys. I mean all of you. I want all of you to come to the full unity of the faith. I want you to know who Christ is and know what that gives you as joint heirs with Him. We're a group of very diverse people. I look out and I see people with all manner of beliefs, all manner of backgrounds, all manner of everything. <laughs> All manner of ideas on how families should be raised, all manner of ideas on how jobs should be done, on how church should be run, on how songs should be sung. And yeah, that all rhymes, and I didn't even plan it. I've been reading too much poetry lately. We all have opinions on these things. But see, the beauty of Christ, and this is what we continue to see every week in the book of Hebrews, down in Sunday school, the beauty of Christ is that when we have Him in common, all that other stuff doesn't matter. When we can fellowship, it doesn't matter even if we speak different languages. I've experienced this in traveling overseas. To be able to fellowship with Christians that don't even speak the same language as you is one of the greatest privileges I've ever had. To be able to realize that we don't even call Christ by the same name because that's an English word to realize that they speak of fellowship and they don't use that word, they use a different one. To realize that our world in Christ is so much greater, so much grander and so much bigger than we could ever have imagined is a wonderful privilege. The things we have different pale in comparison when we have Christ. And so my goal here is to see you all in fellowship, in submission to Christ. Now, how do I do that? I'll take you to our second passage. Yeah, I know. Ten minutes. First Peter chapter 5. Now, most of you got to walk through First Peter with me, verse by verse, phrase by phrase, word by word, sometimes parts of word at a time. 
And I hope you'll remember this in its entirety, but I spoke on this passage for over an hour last time I was in it, so uh, I'm going to try to do that in five minutes. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 of 1 Peter. This I see is my job description. Ephesians chapter 4 is my goal. That's my focus. But here is my job description. And I know our Constitution has my job description, but that's a very verbose way of saying this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, here it is. I have one job. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you exercising oversight, See, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but by being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, the one who actually owns this flock, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. This is my job. And in our culture, we tend to give pastors every job we can possibly imagine. Why isn't he out doing this? Why isn't he doing that? Why isn't he doing these things? Well, I have a great answer for you. If that ever comes up in your mind, it's because this is my job description. It is a full-time job. It is a never-ending job. 24-7. Shepherd the flock of God that's among me. And yeah, I'm looking out, and that's you guys. Now, a shepherd's chief responsibilities are multifaceted. Protect. You know, the word pastor actually comes from the idea of being a shepherd. Protect them. I see wolves trying to get in here. My job is to make them known and make sure you guys understand who they are, and I will not stop in watching out for that. You have to watch out for it too. We've been learning that in Second Peter, but that is my primary responsibility as well. What's another thing the shepherd does? Does he keep his sheep in the desert, mix a bunch of sand and dirt and nothing to eat? No. In fact, when Peter, who wrote this, was talking to Christ, Christ said, do you love me, Peter? He says, yes, I love you, Lord. Do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. Do you love me? Yes. Feed my sheep. I have one responsibility to shepherd the flock of God, multifaceted as it is, to protect you, to feed you. And everything I do here, I want to let you know, I see that as my end goal. I want to see you guys grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I will not stop at anything to make that clear. It has kind of been touched on before. I never planned on getting into church ministry. I wanted to go on missions. I still do. I love overseas missions, and I don't think I'll ever stop loving it. But God's made it clear to me our place here is here. If I'm still here in 20 years, I'll not lie to you, I'll be surprised. But for now and for the foreseeable future, we are here. And as long as I am here, I'll, pr I'll promise you the same thing I promised you when I was being installed here uh, officially, even though this Sunday is the service about that. I'm going to mess up on this. I'm not going to do it perfectly. I'm not going to try to push you on to being like me. I'm going to continue to push you on to be like Christ. Everything I do, everywhere I go, I'm going to see that as my responsibility. And that's the one thing I want you to take home from today, and I think I hit it on ten minutes. <laughs> I see that as my job. And it doesn't go beyond the people, the flock of God that's around me. I am not an evangelist. These are different people in Ephesians 4. God has given some of them to the church for the edification of the body as well. I'm a pastor teacher. And my job is to see you guys pushed on to Christ. And as you become more like Christ, and in my demonstration of the love of the Word of God, which you are absolutely very correct, I don't find anything else more enjoyable than sharing the Word of God. I want you guys to learn that same love. 
I want you guys to learn from this when you're sitting at home, when you're walking along the way, when you're sitting at home, when you're out and about, when you're buying groceries. I want you to rejoice in the Word of God because it is so far beyond anything that we can come up with. All this psychology, all this philosophy, all these ideas and sayings and things like this pale in comparison to this. We have nothing worth trusting and if we do not highly regard the Word of God and from there, I will feed you to the best of my ability for as long as I'm here. I love you guys so much. And I said this a few months ago. I know a lot of us have been a part of churches much bigger than this. I think I beat all of you. The church I grew up in uh, was over 3,000 people. Uh, So I, I know what big churches are like. Some parts of me miss that. Most of me doesn't. I know every one of you. And I get to, for the most part, greet every one of you individually almost every Sunday. And I'd take the 60 of you guys over any church, the 600 that I don't know. Please know that I have your best interest in mind in pushing you on to Christ. That's all I ask. I don't know who's after me, so follow what's on the screen.